helpers from all walks of life. They are supposed to come in and find some relief from the chaos, from the confusion, from commotion, from the atrocities that plagues them daily. The church should be a place where congregants can find peace, belongingness, unity, love, and feel protected. Apostle, you add more to that later. <laughs> <laughs> However, when we look at churches in Africa yeah. and churches in Ghana, more specifically Ghana, because we are dealing with Ghana right now, do these churches possess these attributes mm. that we have looked at? There are numerous incidences that have happened over time, and especially in the last week, in churches in Ghana, which have led people to ask questions. Are churches contributing to this safe haven that is supposed to be available to believers? There are abuses of all forms coming from churches, emotional, verbal, physical. We see them happening. Uh, sometimes people capture these and put them on social media. There are some times if they were not put on social media, we would not even know about them, you know. And some innocent victims, unfortunately, there are even churches where people are sexually abused. There's a lot going on out there. And you have to ask because things cannot be allowed to get out of hands. At the end of the day, it goes around the community and all of us get affected. So the newest trend is the rising mm. incidences of scams where some church leaders use dubious means to <coughs> dupe unsus unsuspecting victims, duping them of uh, cash at the end of the day under different, different ways um, that they use. Now, over the weekend, if, if you were on, active on social media, even if you are not, someone might have sent you a video uh, of self-styled evangelist Patricia Odru Okrante, who is popularly known as Nana Grada, mainly because she used to be a popular fetish priest, later converted to Christianity, according to her, um, and became a reverend. I have no idea what exact body ordained her, a <laughs> reverend. We'll be looking at that later on in the program. Uh, but she has gathered quite a following. And she has been recently accused by some of these followers of duping them of their monies, running into thousands of cities um, under the pretext of doubling the said monies for the church members. Do pastors, men of God, double monies? It would be an interesting, it would be an interesting country if that happens. I'm sure I'll be first to go to, I'll be first in church every Sunday <laughs> if the pastors are doubling double money. money. My priest would see me there every day. Uh, Father Campbell would not be able to get rid of me from church. Now, let's watch the reaction of some of the victims yeah. uh, of this particular incident. Well, we're supposed to uh, have that on your screen shortly uh, of the members of Reverend uh, Patricia Quarantine. We know so first say thousand Ghana and say seven million. What was that name? Name ano? So we made jina ho. Now he's going to be at two hundred. Over bar four hundred. We now watch it. See, we need to be a mama from our phone. A phone now you use it. A the buy. We move away. Yeah, so we don't call phone. We are searching for another day. A mom. Exactly. You these men of God and see what they do for this country. Eh? Uh -huh. People from make study. Why you go call somebody catch it? Eh? You go format that take in thousand million. Your mother, eh? see Ghana. You will go eh, Ghana. You will go for sure. Any what the phone you now? On some point it will. I'm not brown, not brown. So my what? If I don't buy, I'm not going to be Well, that, uh, those were some members of Heaven Way, uh, that's what they call her church, lamenting after they allege that they have been duped uh, by Reverend Patricia Odru, uh, 
Let's just call Henana Agrada for the purpose <laughs> of this discussion, as that is what she's popularly no. uh, called. So the update on that story is that she's been arrested by the Ghana Police Service. Uh, she was put before court today but was denied bail. She's supposed to reappear in court on Thursday. This evening on Spotlight right here, we are looking at the conversation on regulation of churches. We want to find out what the law says and the lapses within the law that allow unscrupulous people to operate. We'll look at the threat of such acts to public safety because essentially it becomes a public safety issue. How the public can protect themselves and why do people engage in such money doubling schemes? Why do you believe it when someone tells you they're going to double your money for you and just hand over? whatever money is in your pocket. Why are we this gullible? Uh, is there any socio-economic reason behind this? Is there some, some desperate poverty that's <laughs> pushing people uh, so desperately to want to double whatever little money they have in their pockets? Or is it possible that it's just greed? Okay. Is it ferocious greed that is pushing people? And lastly, uh, should Christians draw the line between faith and logic. Is faith logical? Is this even possible? We're also going to uh, revisit other issues in this particular conversation, but with great focus on the regulation of churches. I'm going to be speaking with lawyer Christian Mom Hesse, who's a private legal practitioner, because we want to look at the legal uh, implication of, of what is going on. We want to talk to Bernard Odrotechi, who's a chartered economist. Uh, my producer and I were debating if we needed an economist in this uh, conversation. But it, at the end of the day, it's, economic, <laughs> yeah. it's for economic gain yes, that uh, these money doublers uh, work. And it, it's for economic gain that people believe in them and hand over their money. These persons you saw on the screen lamenting, it was for economic gain that they handed over their money to um, Nana Grada, who they allege has bolted with their money. We'll also be speaking with Anaya Akwada, who is Executive Director of the Bureau of Public Safety, and Apostle Theophilus Jeffries is in studio. Uh, his lead pastor, Ever Flourishing City Chapel International, is on the Spintex Road. When he walked in, I was just telling him he is immaculately <laughs> dressed. Now, remember, this show is very interactive, so take your comments and your contributions and take them to our social media. Yeah. We are live streaming on Facebook at MX24 TV. It's live on Facebook and on Twitter, also on YouTube. Uh, leave your comments there. I'll take them shortly. And I promise this evening we will open the lines briefly to take your questions, your comments, and your contributions, which I know you will have a lot yeah. uh, to say. Let me come in studio uh, and come straight to Apostle Theophilus. How did you react? Uh, I'm not going to ask if you've seen it because we just played yes, it. Yes, so yes. even if you didn't see it, you've seen it now. How did you react when you saw this video of uh, these church members, people who say they're going to the house of the Lord to yeah. worship, yeah. and they go to the house of the Lord and end up being duped in yeah. the house of the Lord? Yeah. How does it come across? Well, I wasn't surprised and I wasn't shocked. Hmm. Because we are in time where the human nature or the usual Christian don't go to church to meet God. They go to church, they see church as a shopping mall, mm. they see church as a, a restaurant, and they see church as a, a, a supermarket. So they are either going to be shopping, going for dinner, stuff like that. Majority go to church, few go to Christ. Mm. So, gee, in the days of Christ, Christ even went to the temple where the people have turned the house of God into merchandise, where Christ became very angry and so bitter. He took in charge, and because of the zeal of the Father, he drove them out. In today's world, the Bible even told us that in the last days, people shall become lovers of themselves. So, it is not surprising to me to see this, that the most people who are victims, I can promise you that they are not there to meet Christ. They are not even there for their mm -hmm. spiritual up uplifting them. They are there for either their physical gain, cash, money. While most of these scams center around five, five words, greed, vulnerability, ignorance, manipulation, and witchcraft. 
<laughs> okay, I, I, I will be asking you later how witchcraft comes in, but okay. can you fault the victim? I can fault some of them. Why? Because common sense, common sense, using the word common sense, common to almost everybody. If somebody, one of them should go to uh, maybe a juju person, and then you give them money that do double for you, and they didn't double the money from for you. Mm. Will you call them a victim? No. But because this person supposedly is a, like maybe, uh, well, supposedly a pastor or a Christian kind of so they say they are victims. I didn't even believe that they have forcefully forced the people to send their money there. They willingly, she made the call, she made the invitation, and then they went in there. So although the lady through fraudulent means, she could be charged, stuff like that, the people also... I don't, me, I don't see them as victims. I see them as corporates <laughs> who, 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 who willingly out of greed because within the, the, the corporate space, who double money for you within a short period of time? Mm. Greed actually led them, most people. So although we have to sympathize with them, I will still force them. Okay. You sympathize with them, yeah. but you fault yes. them. Uh, also, this stood out for me. Majority go to church, but few go to Christ. Yeah. I'll press you later uh, on all of this. But yeah. let me just bring in Anaya Akwada, who's uh, executive director at the Bureau of Public uh, Safety. <coughs> Apostle mentioned something. Uh, they're, they're, you said they're culprits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, He thinks that although we have to sympathize with victims, we, we have to also blame them. They need to take some amount of responsibility for moving there and handing over their money in such a, a, a manner. I mean, they should be able to reason it through. There are other arguments that say that there will always be weak people in society. It's the duty of the state to protect them. In this situation, did the state fail to protect them? Should the state be protecting people? What is the state even protecting them against? Is it protecting against their own greed or their own... Um, some, some people have called it stupidity, and that, I mean, uh, Bright Simmons said earlier today that the state cannot protect you from your own stupidity. Yeah. What are we looking at over here? Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope my internet is very static. I hope that you hear me um, clear as I make my submission. Right. Let me say um, good evening to the, the panelists and to your viewers. When we talk about state protection, state protection comes in all forms. So I would, while I want to agree with the gentleman, with the apostle in the studio, mm -hmm. that it is their own making that they've been defrauded, I respectfully would want to draw his attention mm -hmm. to the fact that we have a responsibility to even choose what food we eat, what medications mm -hmm. we buy at yeah. what time, mm -hmm. and where we get these things, but still, have the uh, Food and Drugs Authority that is continuously scanning the market yeah. to mm -hmm. get rid of, you know, unwholesome foods yeah, and unwholesome yeah. medications mm -hmm. on the market. Yeah. And so, to that extent, it is not, um, it will not be appropriate, I don't want to say it will not be accurate, it will not be appropriate to blame these church members Entirely. who are hoodwinked mm. by someone you know, holding herself out as a woman of God. I say this and I want to draw, I, once I mention FDA, one will want to find out, so, so if who? I mention FDA for food tax, which one will be its counterpart in the, the realm churches. of religion? Yes. Look, the, the Agada issue goes beyond a matter of discussing um, church leadership or mm. um, church regulation. It is actually an indictment, okay, on the institution of national security. And if you indulge me, I'll tell you, we have seen Agada and her ilk and many, many of her kind in the, in the past decade or so, you know, on TV, Hmm. proposing or yeah. putting themselves up as people who double money, money. who hmm. can raise the dead and do so hmm. many things. And the national security hmm. has sat aloof yeah, 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 until yes, now. Yes, yes, yes. If ever you have heard of um, hmm. the Jonestown massacre in 1978, and I will indulge your listeners or your viewers to 
just Google that app or just go to um, YouTube and check that out, the Jonestown Massacre. You will see that what we, have, what we are witnessing today is just a light version of that. And the earlier the national security begins to take interest in the um, social and economic spaces of our country, mm. the best time. Because as it stands now, every time we have to hear about national security, then we are looking at political opponents or politics and all. But they have left the social and the economic realm for roads and criminal elements to dominate it. And that is what we are seeing, you know, play out today. The next time, it's not going to be people who have willingly given their money to um, for want of a better word, a froster, it's going to be people who have dedicated their lives and are willing to lay down their very life, their very being, in defense of something that is injurious to their health, in defense of something that is a threat to the state. And so it is absolutely important that the national security or the state begins to show interest in religion, in the church, right. especially in times like this when we are we have been heightened so much about the threat of terrorism and the crossing over of terror elements into our country, it is not prudent for the state to stay out of the religious, social space and economic spaces. Right. Uh, so I, I like that Nanaya brings in a whole different angle, uh, makes it a security issue. Yeah. And, and calls seriously for it to be regulated. But if we're going to regulate churches, who exactly should be regulating them? And what manner should the regulation take? I'll come back to you uh, in a moment for that. But let me just bring in lawyer Christian Mam Hersi. Um, lawyer Mam, so Nanayao is telling us that this is a public issue, it's a security issue, a national security issue, and the state should be up and doing in protecting Ghanaians. Now, as a Ghanaian, and if, let's say, I had fallen victim to one of these schemes or scams by any church, like uh, we have seen uh, in the first video that we played of some of the members of uh, Nana Grade's church, can I sue the state for allowing this to happen? The, the line led a bit. He said, can you sue the state? Yes, if I, I'm party? a victim, yes. Given that the state is supposed to be protecting me and it allowed someone like this to operate freely, is it possible for me to sue? I see it as a remote cause because um, <laughs> um, in as much as one might, one might want to um, sue the state. The matter is whether or not they will be sustained in court and, and that particular suit can see the light of day. <laughs> what is important that um, the, the Act 29, the farthest it en enjoins criminality to this um, has, to do, has to do with the advertisement of such charlatanic practices. <laughs> and um, you can bear me out that Mom, it, can you can you repeat that word again? Shalantanic. <laughs> can you repeat yes, that you word? Again? That. Come again. Can you repeat your word again? I. Shalantanic. Uh, Shalantanic. I see. That's the first time I mm. have come across it. On but, a but, uh, okay, <laughs> please proceed. Yes, um, it uh, is is is. If you read the Act Twenty Nine, Section One One Three Seven, it deals with charlatanic. Okay. Um, practices, advertisements, and all of that. So it is indeed a criminal offense. But the problem is that the National Media Commission and the police have failed the state in, in holding television stations and also um, those practitioners to account. Uh, again, you can also bear me out that um, you, 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 you skip your your, 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 your television channels from one, one channel to the other, and you are going to come across it in a space of some few hours, especially in the evening, 
you are going to come across a number of these things, a number of people and who claim to be either prophets, pastors, mm -hmm. and all of all of that kind, promising and saying all sorts of things. And you wonder what is the level of policing on our media waves? Mm -hmm. It is a problem. What is the National Commission doing about it? To to control content. Mm -hmm. um, is it that the, the, the National Media Commission has 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 relegated its role to the back banners? Um, in situations of section one three seven, which deals with these practices and also not allowing especially the fact that such advertisements ought not be made on media platforms. And to the extent that those practices are carried out on media platforms intended to deceive the public and cause such injury and all of that, persons should be ruled by the law and ought to be arraigned before court and fined. But what is happening? It's not the first time this, this, this matter has come up. It has come up several years. And right. there, seems, there seems not to be um, any form of enforcement. But indeed, the laws, we have the laws for enforcement. This is just quite different from that of Rwanda. The difference is that Rwanda, Rwanda deals with it in a very direct form. We don't have a direct legislation that deals with the regulation of churches or faith-based activities. Mm. So apart from dealing with Session 137 and other matters which probably might spill over to um, matters relating to defrauding by false pretense, we don't necessarily have laws that regulate faith-based organizations. In Rwanda, they have it such that before you, upon, upon the inception of the law to regulate these faith-based organizations, you must have a qualification in theology. Yeah. If upon inception of the law, you don't have it, the law gives you five years within which to come up with that particular uh, qualification, so you regulate your church. All financial donations are channeled or to pass through a reputable financial institution. All gifts are to be declared to the governing board. You understand? So these are laid down regulations. Right. So uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Lawyer Maum. So Lawyer Maum is saying there should be some serious you just cannot regulation. Get up to do anything. You just cannot. You just cannot. You just cannot get up to purport to. You just cannot get up to purport to um, operate a faith-based organization right. in the country. Right. It takes leadership. It takes will. It right. takes leadership. It takes that political will. It takes the will of enforcement agencies. Right. I agree it's with that. It's not this was activity where um, you now have Agrada getting to the limits of this point, and then you are seeking to show to the general public that you are up and doing. It right. is not enough. Even just this evening, you have media houses showing all of these things on their televisions, their television channels. What happens to Section 137? Right. What happens to the media commission? So it, it just begs the question. It is just like, um, uh, let me digress a bit. Ekwia Polo, when her matter came up um, under obscenity, and all, this, all, all of them went up in arms. When it need... There are laws that guard against obscenity under okay, Act, right. Act 29 right. and it joins the enforcement agencies to deal with it. You go on Instagram and other places or social media, you have all of these things happening. And nobody so is regulating is it. Yeah. A wishy wishy approach. It is just a, a reactionary approach, I think, but all better than nothing. Thank you, Nana Yao. Uh, sorry, lawyer Christian Mom Hesse. Uh, he seems quite. <laughs> passionate about this topic there should be so much more regulation than we're seeing and he talks about the law we have the law it seems Ghana's case um, needs to be studied further because we have all the laws that are necessary to regulate everything except that these laws are never enforced mm -hmm. in in any form at all let me go to uh, our chartered economist Bernardo Drutechi 
Uh, Bernard, can you hear me? Yeah, far long, I can hear you. Can you hear me too? I can hear you uh, clearly. Now, why will people engage in these deceptive schemes? Why do people throw caution to reason? In, in a situation where you can clearly see that if people are reasoning properly, they will not involve themselves in it. Is it a case of economic hardship that is causing people to get so desperate that they do not care? They, they, they want to, they see a, a clear risk, but they want to take the risk because there's that small hope there of some financial gain. Hello, very good evening. Okay. Uh, to I'm, yourself, my very good other panelist. Right. I've lost, I've lost a bit of voice, so kindly pardon me for that. That's okay. Uh, in my candid view, in my candid view, you have the Ministry for Chief Tense and Religious Affairs in Ghana. Mm. And if you look at the embodiment of that ministry, mm -hmm. it is supposed to put out rules and regulations because you see, if you pick the constitution of Ghana, we have specific laws. But beyond the specific laws, you also need specific regulation to regulate entities and organizations. So per the embodiment of Ministry for Chieftains and Religious Affairs, that is the body mandated per the constitution of Ghana to ensure that people at any time will put out behavior that is in compliance with the spirit and the letter of the 1902 constitution. So to the extent that the ministry has been so relaxed in its attempt to ensure some specific regulation that will go a long way to ensure that we sanitize the ambit of religiosity that, in my candid view, is failure on the part of the ministry. Prince Kofi Amwabin said something when he was being interviewed on TV3 about a week ago that you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. Mm. What it simply means is that if you are in charge of the economic scope of Ghana, and as a ministry, you delegate some of these powers to bodies like the NCC, SHRAG, National Media Commission, BNR, etc., and you still see some of these things being, being, being continuously happening, then it's best to affirm the statement of Prince Kofi Mwabin that any entity in Ghana tasked by the law of Ghana to ensure compliance, but rather decide to delegate such an authority, but begin to kind of shield their responsibility, there's a great cause for worry. Now, let me come to this, a concept we call a concept of subrogation, which mm -hmm. simply means that Negligent third people should not be allowed to go scot-free. I repeat, if you take insurance and risk management, there is a concept we call subrogation. Subrogation simply means that you must never ever allow negligent third party to go scot-free. Who are the negligent parties here? It is the congregants. They demonstrated willful and intentional negligence. So if you take, if you are managing risk and you have people who day in and day out, see people being scammed, people being duped. But in the face of all this numerous evidence, incontrovertible evidence that people are being scammed day in and day out, and these people willingly, intentionally, out of greed and out of being rich overnight, begin to ensure that they want to engage in money doubling, then I can tell you that the, the police service of Ghana, National Media Commission, BNI, in as much as we want to punish Agrada, we must equally also admit that the concept of subrogation, when it comes to risk management, also places the congregant in a situation of also being scrutinized. Mm -hmm. The net of it all is that if you take the case study of Rwanda and that of Ghana, Rwanda is a country whereby you have a certain leader who has shown the way that if you take what Kaman, Kaman said that religion is the opium of the people, opium of the masses, who simply means that organizing people into united masses. If you take Rwanda, Rwanda has made a clear cut study that we should be able to distinguish between religiosity and spirituality. And this, I think, people ought to understand. Waking up to go to church, to pray, to sing, to fast, to dine, doesn't make you too, too spiritual. I would love to be spiritual than being religious. If you take the Article 21 of the 2 Constitution, it makes Ghana a secular state. But the fact is that because the Christendom society, according to Ghana's Saskar service, is average around between 70 to 78 percent because of such a sheer number of dominance, most political actors are afraid to put in place regulation that will ensure that we sanitize the system. Far longer, I will tell you one thing. If you take Christianity, Islam, and any other religion, it is supposed to be so winning than so scamming. 
Christianity is supposed to be soul winning, but no souls coming. When you look, you catch your eyes around in society today, a lot of the religious entities today are scamming people than rather saving them. If I have a pastor, I have an apostle, the Christian industry is so huge. You have the apostle, the pastor, etc. They're supposed to ensure that they win souls. However, ironically, most of these men of God scam the souls than winning them to Christ. And there's a lot of there's a lot of economic implications on some of these soul, soul scamming. And I'll tell you one thing. If you take most of the one-man churches, compare with most established churches like the Methodists where I worship, Pentecost, Evangelical Church, etc., a lot of these one-man churches contribute to demand pool inflation in the country. And for long, let me make it simple for you. Mm. Take one-man churches like Agrada, Obi Nim, and the rest you can mention their name. At the end of the worship every Sunday, they take their money, they don't account to anybody. These people end up depositing this money in offshore accounts. And continuously, as these things go on, it has a negative impact on even the stability of our currency. Let me flip the narrative to the most established churches in Ghana. Take the Catholic Church and look at their contribution in the educational sector, in the health sector, even at times in road construction. Compare that one to the one-man churches. How many of the one-man churches do you see them offering corporate social responsibility at the established churches to do? For me, if we are talking about the economy, let us all appreciate that. The very moment we create this leeway for mm. people to be scammed, people thinking of double money, it has a negative consequential impact on even the stability of our currency. Then also, it has a rippling effect of making people lazy. And I'll tell you one thing. When you go to Europe, Asia, etc., people work out from Monday to Friday, and they are taken of going to job. They are taken of employability. Come to Ghana from Monday to Sunday, it's all about tongues. It is a if Ghanaians know God than any other continent. Let me take you to China, where today most of our leaders in Africa we are gallivanting to China looking for loans to, to kind of build our economy. The China that we go, China is spiritual but not too religious. But come to Ghana today, we have all the Christians holding key positions, but the corruption we see every day, where does it come from? So far on for me, I'm sick and tired of the institutional failure. And like what, as the lawyer indicated, look, most of these state actors know what to do, but they decide not to do, and when some of these things happen, they put in play the kind of rational energy approach to create the impression that it's a firefighting approach and it will not work. I would recommend that. Let us go the way of Rwanda. Let us crowd the ship. Right. If we can enact laws and regulation to regulate the business community, educational community, why can't mm, we, as a mm, nation, mm. say that through the Ministry of Children's and Religious Affairs, let us put in place stringent, robust regulation to say that if you want to set up a chair, these are the way to go. I am not sure that Ghana is closer to God than China is. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Bernard Odru Techi is a chartered accountant. He's introduced uh, so many different angles. But the common theme that's running through is the need for regulation. Let me come in studio because I want to find out from Apostle. When people talk about regulating churches, is this something you buy into, uh, first of all? Because there are some men of God and some Christians who say that religion should not be regulated. You cannot regulate the belief of the people. But can we regulate how these churches operate, how these churches are uh, composed, who they report to? Can, can we, how do we regulate the church? Okay, so the church as a body, as an institution, can be regulated. But you cannot regulate how somebody should worship God, faith. How do you regulate faith? Right. Faith can be regulated. Then we should be going to regulate the, the Muslims, the monks, and other religious body, the shrine. We mm, should, they should mm. all come in. Why are we not just talking about the, the other, other aspect, traditional, uh, the Muslim, and other ones? Only church, 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 church. Is it that there are no mices there or so, vices So there? you think it's more of regulating religion? Religion, not yes. Just one. And it's going to be very difficult stuff to do because within our our structural system in Ghana. The laws are there, they, they don't work. The systems are there, those to enforce it are not there. So to me, it's not even that the laws are not there. For example, the Christian Council is there. The Ghana Pentecostal Council is there. But then again, it comes to individuality. Like the, one of them said that uh, one-man churches. When they say one-man church, I don't know what he meant by one-man one churches. One person. Because, in, in because when you go to some of the churches, he, be, he may be referring to as one-man churches. They are not one-man churches. They are under regulation. They have board. They have trustees. 
They have intellectual people who are there. They are MPs who are on their board. Mm -hmm. Take a church like a Paris. But that's not one man. I it's not one man. Yeah. Take, but he didn't mention them. He only mentioned mm. Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox churches. Uh, I think mean, I'll go back to him yes. later. But I also believe what he meant was uh, someone like he mentioned uh, mm. uh, Obinim, yes. Agrada, Good. things like that. One, You see one person who's in charge of everything Good. and no answers to nobody. Good. When you walk into a church... Yeah where the, the, there's one person in charge yeah. and answers to no one, yes. how do we ensure that these places are sanitized or conform uh, to, excuse me, say, logical processes Good. to avoid okay. things like we just saw? Good. You see, then again, for example, let's say somebody just woke up. Mm. We don't know which Bible school he went. Mm. Even that Bible school he went, is the Bible school accredited? Is it recognized? So we should start with the institutions. So if you are graduating from a Bible school, which school is that? Is that school recognized by the state? So can we say that mm. we require all churches to have uh, a lead pastor or pastor Good. who has been through an, a form of system, educational system, has been taught properly before they come out? Like they were saying in Rwanda, Very. you need at least theology, yes. a degree in theology. Yes. Can we say we, such a requirement is necessary? It's necessary. see... The Bible is key on that. For lack of knowledge, my people perished. Okay. Okay. So the Bible didn't underplay the role of knowledge and enlightenment. Jesus even said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and come and learn of me. Then again, I said earlier on that, the people that we have in society today, they are a, a hazard rat race people, like a, a microwave generation. Quick, 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 quick miracle. They don't want process. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go to the place, so they come to church. Somebody comes to church within one month. He expected to just become a millionaire overnight. It won't happen, even if God will give you a baby to take nine months. God is a miracle worker, but not a magician. But the age where we are trying to push the pastors to become magicians, so they are under pressure. You must perform, you have to do stuff. So, so knowledge is key, education is key. In the Bible, Apostle Paul was very educated, very enlightened. So we saw even his approach to the work that he did in the scriptures. So education is necessary. Pastors should be educated, go for more education, more enlightenment. If that is a key, trust me, most of the, the vices will be gone. And usually an educated pastor, when enlightened, usually you don't really see them in some of these weird kind of stuff. For example, you are very enlightened. You don't spit on people's face to give them healing you are a little enlightened mm -hmm. but when we go into the bible there's some cases like that you will be you'll be a bit decorum a bit circumspect a bit you are well mannered well behaved well spoken about your present stuff so education is key so pastors should be allowed to go to school then again the school should be regulated mm. the institution mm. that uh, ordained pastors like, okay you are an ordained pastor who ordained you which institution ordained you we have a lot of uh, places now you can just go for ordination you say you are an ordained pastor. Under what? Are you gazetted? Most of them have not even been gazetted. Lances to officiate weddings, lances to conduct funeral. It's not even there. So the state then again should come into the system where we first go into the institution that train the pastors, the institution that lances the pastors. If they are well regulated, well lances, I'm sure pastors who are going through such institution, when they are coming up, they'll be well behaved. Right. Uh, thank you, Apostle. I'm just going to go to uh, Nana Alquada. If you're still there, I'll come back to you again, Apostle. But I'm also going to open the phone line shortly uh, so our viewers can chip in there before we, we, we leave uh, this place. Nana Yao, um, will you support calls for these stringent, uh, more stringent measures? We mentioned regulation. He talks about uh, education, for example. We should ensure that pastors are well educated, have been through some form of training that is accredited or certified. But beyond that, how do we ensure that they, they don't, you know, go overboard or go off plan when, when they're operating? Well, um, thank you. Thank you. I think, um, let me just record it. In my first submission, I did mention that it will be important for the state to be actively involved in, you know, in the religious space. Uh, and I, make, I made mention of social 
and economic spaces, and not only limiting themselves to um, politics and political opponents, where I drew in and narrowed down to the national security. And I think somewhere in Chapter 5 of the 1992 Constitution, it raises the issue of the right to worship. And it's an entrenched clause in our Constitution. So um, I think that I, I, I would not, you know, go for the base of regulating the church mm. or someone, as someone would put, regulating faith. I have called for active involvement of the state. And I will explain what I mean by that. Look, we, there are laws that regulate behavior. There are okay. laws that, you know, prescribe what good governance is in corporate bodies. And churches are registered as corporate bodies, you know, as non-profit organizations for that matter. There are laws that border on taxes, you know, um, donations, gifts, etc. These laws, financial administration laws, it is very, very important for the state to show high level of interest in what is happening in this space, pay these laws and apply them to the latter. If we can apply human behavior laws, we can apply corporate governance laws, we can apply the financial administration you know, laws, and some of these bodies should be able to clean their space. In the absence of that, we will be sitting on a time bomb because I made reference earlier to the Jonestown massacre, which today appears like it's an overkill. But yesterday, I had a shock of my life watching one of your sister networks, you know, in their 7 um, o'clock bulletin, where they narrowed down on someone I've been seen on social media and I thought he was just a comedian. <laughs> Apparently, he is a religious leader. He has a whole lot of following, and the thing that he teaches and preaches, you know, I cannot say is absurd, but it's suspicious. These are things that we need the state to be interested in, and not to regulate, but to ensure that they hold such bodies, you know, accountable against all the um, uh, the laws and the acts and regulations that we have in the country, we should be able to clean the space. Right. So the state should hold religious organizations accountable. I'm just going to open the phone lines and then go straight uh, to Lawyer Maum because I want to find out from Lawyer Maum uh, exactly what crime we're looking at if, if we decide that th there's been some criminal activity that has gone on here uh, how can it be approached but if you're watching the phone lines are 0204738481 again 0204738481 and then 0550331511 that's 0550331511 I'll go to uh, lawyer mom if you're still there um, let's assume uh, that we, we want to bring some specific charges against anyone in the midst of all of this, the, the uh, members of Agrada's church, if, if they say she's, uh, you know, been engaged in criminal activity. What charges is she likely to face? Okay, I, I will not seek to speculate, but um, I hear that the, the matter, the is, in matter court. is before the the court mm -hmm. is before circuit court nine at um at accra um i'll not want to delve into too much but it will generally come under the broader fraudulent offenses that she probably be charged with either defaulting by false pretense or, or that that's the most preferable charge but right um, once, he, once the matter has gone before the court, there should be a proper drawn charge sheet that the prosecution will put before the court for her possible bail and then... Um, the bail has been denied already. So, yes, okay. Uh, uh, lawyer Ma, I'll come back to you, but bail has already been denied. Uh, we have someone on the line from the Volta region. Let me just hear him and then we'll continue the discussion. Uh, hello, good evening. Good evening. 
I'm basing the terms I'm having from one word. Right. Let's listen to you. Yeah, please, you know, as a country, um, we have a problem that we need an immediate address. Because even looking at, you, you made an uh, example like China. Looking at a country like China, they have regulations for this kind of checking. But what do we see? They are almost developed. We go there to borrow money. But over here, you know, generation doesn't make it like God is there to do everything for us. We have the brain, we have the heart, we have the legs to go anywhere, to work and then develop our vicinity. So it, it is not important always going to this one market. They are defrauding people. Look at right. the aspects that they have been doing. Thank it you. It is all related to like easy <sighs> way of getting money. But in this world, there's no easy way of getting money. Nowadays, you will hear this. 10, 11, 12 years old uh, uh, kids killing their colleagues for money which was and stuff like that. It is not only Thank you so much. Uh, it looks, looks like uh, he's trying to make a point that things are pretty uh, degenerating. I have another caller on the line. I can't take the calls for too long. I'm hoping I can get a few more before we go off. Uh, good evening. Your name and where you're calling from? Okay, I think we've lost him over there. Uh, let me come back in studio. I'm just going to go to Apostle. Give me one minute. Sum it up for me. Uh, Christians are listening. Your congregation yeah. is listening. You Sum see, it up for one, one minute and then I'll move on. Number one, the lady in charge, number one, the two things here, is she transformed or she has transitioned? Because uh, it does transform. Transformation is where she has totally changed. Because we have incidents like that in the Bible where there was a guy called Simon the Sorcerer who was in, who was into, uh, was a fetish priest. Mm. Then Apostle Peter came to, the, came to the town and then he preached the gospel. She got intrigued by it and then decided to get converted. Then he started following Peter along the way. Means he had Peter as a mentor. But along the way, Peter started laying hands on people. They were receiving the Holy Spirit. Then he saw that, was so captivated. Then he offered Peter money that collect this money so that you give me this power that you are using to lay hands on people. So you see, that guy wasn't convicted. He was just transitioned. So, so maybe the lady in question, maybe she has not fully been, uh, her heart has not been fully been convicted, changed. Mm. Her, the old practices, she just, you know, converted straightly into the religion with uh, a change of uh, identity, a change of uh, location, rebrand, like, like, could be like a rebranded stuff. Number two, it may be that she has changed, but she's a novice. The okay. enemies that you... You are working with the devil will come after you, want to embarrass you, want to whatever. So if that's also the case, she needs to be careful who is her mentor, who does she stay under, who is she responsible to. In this case now, who can we refer to as her, her, her mentor, her, her boss that is leading her? All right. these things should be put into proper perspective. Thank you, Apostle Theophilus Jeffries. He's lead pastor, ever flourishing city, Chapel International. He says the devil will come after you. And I was wondering, is it possible that you can also go after the devil? Because so, some of these people, they, they look like they can go after the devil all by themselves. But uh, uh, Bernard Odro, just please give me one minute. Uh, I would love to avert the mind of everybody to Article 11, uh, Clause 7. Subsection A, B, C of the 1902 Constitution. And it is clear, you need regulation. Anybody who says that we can regulate faith, I totally disagree. We have standard of practice. Rwanda has shown the way. Mm. And I intimated in my, in my earlier remarks that if you can sanitize and regulate your Christendom and other uh, belief system, it has a positive impact on the economy. My focus is not only regulating churches. I spoke about ministry for chieftaincy and religious affairs. So by religious affairs, we are talking about the Islamic religion and any other religion that ought to be given a standard of practice. So going forward, I would love to humbly play that. The Minister of Chieftaincy and uh, Religious Affairs will begin to put in place a, a, a kind of a legislative instrument, an instrument that to see to make sure that people who want to lead people to heaven must be, begin to behave in a certain framework and a certain standard. But if we say that because we cannot regulate faith, we must allow people to practice the faith the way they want it. It will get to a point that if Ghana is not careful, we are going to have a certain man or woman of God who will say that anybody who wants to attend my church must be naked. This <laughs> is not fair. But when we put in place a regulation, trust me, it will get to a point that Ghana will become the shining star 
and the low test time when it comes to religious affairs and the regulation, not only in Africa, but globally. Thank global. you, Bernard. Thank you so much. Uh, Bernard Udrotechi is a chartered economist. Uh, I'll just go to um, lawyer Christian Malm to give me one minute summary. Well, your mom, if you can hear me, just one minute, please. Okay, I'm not getting your line clearly there, but I was talking to Nana Yao quite earlier, but I'll still take his, his one minute. Uh, Nana Yao, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate this one minute. Look, um, I'm not too sure about regulating faith, but I still want mm -hmm. to say that the state must be involved in the church. Registration and re-registration of the church is not enough, or of religious bodies is not enough. We need to apply existing laws and statutes to the latter. We need mm. to understand that we need to hold these bodies strictly accountable to behavior, acceptable forms of behavior within our system. We need to hold them up to high standards of corporate governance, we need to hold them up to the financial administration statutes and laws that exist in our space. And we need to get them to um, let us know who is funding them, how they are using their funding, what is their source of those funding, where those funding coming from, among other things that are already existing in our legal you know, right. Um, right. Um, Thank uh, you. realm. Then I, uh... We need to hold these institutions hold you strongly to what Accountable. exists already. And I think that will be able you, to sanitize the state. Awesome. Nanaya Akwada is Executive Director of the Bureau of Public uh, Safety. Now, lawyer Mao, I see I have you back online. If I can just take your one minute. Yes, I'm here. Yes, thank you. One minute, please. Okay. Um, what would a last tip from me? Yes, one minute in one minute. Yes, um, I, I, I would say, in as much as we have the absence of a direct legislation to deal with faith-based organizations, the regulator for media houses should be up and doing. Okay. There are a lot of um, shala, uh, uh, shalanatic practices all over uh, uh, media houses. You, you switch one channel to the other, the practices are not deserving and also um this shouldn't be just a tea in a cup it shouldn't be one off thing like equipping equipping polos on that 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 happened and they caused a lot of um public stare to believe that institutions are working we should see the continuous rolling of um institutions so that there will be um, a greater belief than what we are experiencing and uh, that will nip the whole thing in the bud. Right. Thank you so much, lawyer Christian Mamhesi is a private legal practitioner. The general agreement here is that there should be some form of accountability mm -hmm. where religious organizations are concerned when they involve themselves in any activity that the law covers. They should be held to the requirements of the law and be asked to be accountable and be responsible for their actions. Because at the end of the day, we do not want to de descend into a society that is chaotic and that causes confusion and crime to fester uh, and affect all of us. This evening, I spoke with lawyer Christian Mamhesi. I spoke with Bernardo Duotechi, who's a chartered economist. I spoke to Nana Yawakwada, executive director of the Bureau of Public Safety and Apostle Theophilus Jeffries uh, from the ever flourishing City Chapel International was right here in studio with me. I hope that you at home have been able to learn something that you can apply to your Christian life or your religious life and come out a better person in your practices. My name is Nuong Falong. On behalf of the entire team here at MX24 Television, I'd like to thank you for your time. Join us again same time tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock. Good evening.